Welcome to the Healthcare Unfiltered Express, where I conduct short video interviews packed with relevant and timely information that you cannot miss. So sit back and enjoy the show. Well, it's always fun to talk to my friend and colleague, Dr. Bishoy Faltas from Cornell. And uh, welcome, Bishoy, and Healthcare Unfiltered Express. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Shami, for having me. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And I did get commitment from you that after Ask OGU, we're going to have a longer episode because I really want a lot of folks to know about your career path, what you have done. You're doing amazing work in the lab. I'm a big fan of all of the impact that you have done. But uh, we don't have enough time today to go over this. But, uh, but I did get the commitment after Ask OGU. Get ready. Uh, it would be my pleasure. Uh, we we are striving hard to do the best science we can and try to make an impact for uh, patients with uh, cancer. Well, we appreciate everything you're doing, Bishoy. So ESMO 2025 just concluded um, a week, a couple of weeks ago, and so on. And what I wanted to talk to you about is how the data from ESMO um, in urothelial cancer, in GU cancers, whatever you looked at, affect translational research and the type of questions that you are going to try answering. You are focused on the lab, you do a lot of translational work, and obviously when you go to these meetings, there's a new information, there's new data, there's a lot of new things that evolve, and as you sit there, whether you're presenting or you're listening and viewing, I'm sure you are taking notes, well, I'm going to probably do things differently. Maybe this affects what I'm going to do. So take us through the data from ESMO that really can affect the future research and the type of questions you're trying to answer in the lab. Yeah, thank you, Shani. So I think, uh, and we definitely in my lab try, and in our research program here at Wild Cornell, we're definitely trying to have the clinical questions guide what we do in the lab. Uh, and that still means that we are very interested in doing and understanding the deep biology, but with keeping an eye on what that would mean uh, from a translational standpoint. So I will start my clinical practice and, and, and most of my research are focused on urothelial cancer. So that's what I was following uh, very closely uh, here at, uh, at ESMO 2025. And I think this is a great year for uh, bladder cancer, urethia cancer research, and, and kudos to the conference organizers, Tony Schwery and Miriam Shalaby, who uh, had really done a great job putting this program together with all these uh, GU abstracts and specifically for bladder cancer. So I will start with the EV303 study, which is a neoadjuvant uh, EV Pembro in uh, patients uh, with uh, cisplatin ineligible urethelial cancer. And this is, you know, the results were really outstanding, really sort of blew us out of the water for the primary endpoint, the hazard ratio is 0.4. There's an overall survival benefit. Uh, pathologic complete response rate is 57% in the uh, intention to treat population and even higher than that in the patients who actually underwent cystectomy. It's a really uh, you know, transformative uh, result by, uh, by all accounts. And if you start thinking about what questions uh, in terms of what we do in the lab uh, and how do we use tr the best translational science to apply to this, I think a few questions come up. First, which, I, which sounds obvious, but we still have no idea. Why does EV Pembro work so well in patients with uh, bladder cancer? What's really the underlying biology there? I am thinking about a lot of different hypotheses. I don't think, again, we know. Is it really, is it additive or synergistic? I think Matt Galski has some nice analysis that suggests it's additive, and, and that's enough to see this outstanding activity. But maybe there's something biologically there that uh, more than what meets the eye. And I think that's something that we're trying to think about. Is it that there are some specific effects of the uh, EV on the immune cells that, uh, you know, synergize with pembrolizumab, or is it really through a cancer cell intrinsic effect of, of EV that we haven't profiled or understood yet? Uh, so some of the challenge with that is that because it works so well, it's 
a bit hard to get samples from patients uh, post EV. So in some ways, we're sort of victims of our own success here. Uh, and you could argue, well, we don't necessarily care why it works so well as long as it works so well. But I do care. And I want to know that because I think it's important to understand that. Uh, because if you think about it, now that it moves to the first line setting or is going to move to the first line setting, so this is in the cisplatin eligible population, we're awaiting the results in the uh, cisplatin eligible population. Uh, it's currently first line uh, in the metastatic setting. It's really important to understand what are we going to do next? Because if it, uh, inevitably there's going to be patients in the metastatic setting, about 70% response, but there are about 30% of patients who are not going to respond right away. So, you know, primary refractory, if you will, and about another 30 to 40% who are going to respond initially, but then progress. So about 70% of patients eventually are going to need something else. Uh, we're in the early days of EV Pembro, so that's um, something that we need to really understand and I really do think that the biology here should drive the clinical development. How, uh, how, do, you, how do you try to find out why the response? Like, what, what's your uh, approach to try to find the answer? Yeah, so I think it needs to be a multi-pronged approach. I think it needs to be an approach in, in uh, experimentally in the lab. And we are developing some systems with patient-derived organoids and... Uh, co-culture systems and that enable longitudinal uh, tracking at a single cell level of these uh, tumors and trying to understand is it clonal evolution, which is, you know, sort of one of my key areas of re research uh, is, is uh, understanding clonal evolution of cancers over time uh, under the effects of specific drugs. So we have done a lot of work in this area with cisplatin. And I think it's important for us to start, start doing the same thing. It, with EV Pembro. Uh, and again, I think the laboratory work can really be informative here. Uh, but also, I think you want to do that with patient samples to make sure that whatever you're studying in the laboratory is recapitulating the actual tumor biology and, and what happens in patients. So I think it ha really has to be a multi, uh, you know, a, a two pronged approach where, where the lab and, you know, sort of bench to bedside and back, uh, the lab and the clinic are, are working together. So that's uh, one way that we're trying to do that. Um, so so these, are, these are some of the ideas that I have about EV303. The other interesting point here, and we were just talking about AI, uh, is that we eventually, because of the very high pathologic complete response rate, we are definitely heading in the direction of bladder preservation. The big question, uh, or it's actually, I think it's two questions, is, how do we, you know, under the umbrella of how do we select the best patients for bladder preservation? And there, I, there are two questions under that. One is what is the natural history uh, of a patient who gets, who receives EV Pembro in the neo, neoadjuvant setting or, you know, at that point without having surgery, goes on to have bladder preservation and where is that relapse going to happen? Is it going to be a distant relapse? Is it going to be happening in the bladder? Is it going to be happening in the bladder and then leading to a metastatic disease? Uh, is it going to be CIS in the bladder, but then metastatic disease elsewhere from micrometastatic uh, clones that preexisted? We have no idea. Uh, so that's one question. Now, that sometimes gets conflated with another question, which is now we have all these wonderful tools to start looking at these compartments. So we have ctDNA, where it's getting continuing to get better. We have urine cell-free DNA, which can look at the bladder. We have, you know, more better imaging. Uh, and we have, you know, we have all of this information. So... In terms of, I think the second question is probably the easier one. I mean, none of this is easy, but I think the second question is one that I can start, we're, we're thinking about both. But the second question, I would say the the way forward there is multimodal data integration by AI, which, and I was just mentioned to you, we just published a paper with Fei Wang uh, at the, in, in March of 2025, where we developed multiple layers that get fused together. So we trained a model for each type of data. So you can imagine 
taking ctDNA and training a model based on ctDNA, CFDNA training a model based on ctDNA, uh, in initial tumor genomic information and uh, RNA expression training a model based on that, and then fusing the outputs of these models to uh, come up with a predictor that is much, much better than the traditional way of doing this, ctDNA positive, then CTD ctDNA negative. Um, you know, there's a, a, you know, an FGFR3 mutation versus FGFR3 wild type. There's so much that the data there that the sort of the, the, the manifold of data that we have there is, is extensive and we're just only limited by our ability to combine and integrate all this data into a biomarker. So that's the sort of the biomarker question. Then there is the biology question and the natural history question. And I think we need to do a lot more uh, translational work to really understand where are these recurrences coming from and what's the natural history of these patients who are going to um, have bladder preservation following EV Pembro. I'm working with a good friend of mine, Phil Abash, and we have a, a, a grant application together uh, in, to work on uh, exactly that question uh, with combinations of urine, cell-free DNA, ctDNA, and applying whole genome sequencing to urine uh, cell-free DNA, and then trying to really understand what's the effect of the drugs uh, and the effect then and, and the natural history of the disease uh, in, in that setting. Oh, that's amazing. So, um, Maybe in the in the in the next few, just we have only a couple of minutes left. Um, the the um, CTD there's a lot about CTDNA and how this applied for uh, bladder preservation, and maybe you can figure out sometimes patients that potentially you can avoid radical cystectomy. It seems like. Um, what what's your sense of um, the readiness of this information for? real life practices today, I guess. I mean, is it, are we ready this to apply or do you still think there's a couple of additional questions before people can utilize this in day-to-day -day practices to make these clinical decisions? And I'll let you go after that. That's an excellent question. I, I think it really depends on, so, so I think this is, it really depends on the question because I think traditionally the way we have done this, as I mentioned, is say, is, is grouping patients into ctDNA positive, ctDNA negative, or applying some threshold. Uh, and, and I sort of understand the impetus to do that in a clinical trial, so, and, and that has worked really well in some of the clinical trials. So there's the, the, uh, the, the recent New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, by, by Tom Powles and, 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 and Matt uh, Galski and others. Uh, were, were uh, with ctDNA guided therapy. So I think there are many ways to do this. And in that particular setting, you know, that is the appropriate way to do it. Uh, I, th I have a sense that that's going to change uh, or, or that the threshold or the way to use the ctDNA is going to be different, very different, for example, in a bladder preservation population uh, because of all the things that I mentioned earlier um, and for example, we are seeing in patients even with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer that they could be quote unquote ctDNA positive, some of them. So uh, what, what does that mean for bladder preservation in, in that setting? Or what happens if somebody has a, you know, a, a non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but they're ctDNA positive? So I think that those uh, criteria and the way we're doing this is going to have to be very sensitive to the question. There isn't sort of a universal way of looking at patients as ctDNA positive and ctDNA negative. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, my friend, Dr. Bishoy Faltas on Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Really appreciate you, and uh, we will see you soon at the at the bigger one after Asco GU. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Until next time, take care.